Hello, everyone. Welcome here in the, for the final keynote session. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce our keynote speaker. So as you know, this is the third keynote already of the conference and the final one. And we have here Georgi Dimitrov from the European Commission, Education and Culture. And he will be giving a talk, Digital Education in EU's Digital Decade. I want to give you a few words about uh, Georgi Dimitrov. He joined the European Commission in 2008 and until 2003 was involved in various roles in setting up the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, also called EIT. In 2014-2015, Georgi managed HEI Innovate, an initiative by the European Commission and the OECD that supports entrepreneurial and innovative universities. He then acquired experience as a policy advisor to senior management. In January 2017, Georgi assumed the role of deputy head of the unit Innovation and EIT and uh, in, in the uh, DG Education and Culture, where he was responsible for the EIT and its strategic innovation agenda 2021-2027. So the first digital education action plan and innovation and education, including business university cooperation. In January 2021, he became the head of the newly created unit for digital education, which coordinates the digital education and implements the new digital education action plan. So Georgi, we are very happy that you are here and that you will be giving us such a direct insight in these action plans, and we are uh, looking forward to your talk and discussing with you. So the floor is yours. So um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Tine, and um, uh, good morning to all the participants um, in this um, conference. Uh, I am very honored that I have been invited to uh, let's say be part of your final day. Um, I have. Um, followed a little bit the days as you have been progressing. I mean, it's uh, a little bit too much probably for, for me to know everything around it, but I have seen how, um, how rich and how um, exciting the program was. So um, I just want to congratulate you, even though I'm realizing that I'm doing it rather late uh, on the final day. But um, nevertheless, um, I, I, I think that um, uh, it is a real pleasure for, for me to be here and to be part of um, the 16th, uh, as it happens, um, conference of the uh, European Association of Technology Enhanced Learning. And um, it's a very nice number. Um, it, uh, it says a lot about uh, what um, experiences you have already gathered. Um, it says also, um, I think, symbolically a lot about how important uh, um, you uh, can uh, even, you know, how even more important you can become. So it's a good timing actually to, to exchange. So thank you. Um, also um, to Carlos and uh, for the for the um, uh, personal invitation. So what I would like to do is um, I will be uh, speaking a little bit out of my um, perspective as uh, someone who has um, just received uh, well just it's like uh, nine months ago, but I have received uh, the uh, responsibility for um, the digital education, um, let's say unit which was created as you Tina have suggested. Um, and I would like to present to you a little bit uh, my perspective as um, someone who is um, um, responsible for digital education at the EU level. It will be um, about the digital education action plan, but it will be also about the longer term development and where we want to go with it. Because I feel that uh, you will agree with me that we are at an inflection point for technology enhanced learning. And it is, a, it is very important to listen to, to each other uh, actually now. Um, and I would be very, very keen to hear and to, to listen to whatever comments or questions you would have. So therefore I aim to speak for not that long as the, the, the window, the time window suggests. Okay, so um, I will just start with the very obvious. Um, and uh, I have um, on purpose chosen this um, more provocative kind of title, um, just to, to make sure that um, I express also the, um, maybe the, the way we have um, observed what has happened. Um, I think it's appropriate to, to talk about a, uh, a kind of system shock, um, in particular to the, to the education and training systems. 
and um, it is um, something that um, uh, has been, as it has always been said, uh, very unprecedented. And uh, I think it is something which uh, has um, given us a great deal of um, real life and real time even experience uh, on some things that have been uh, so far uh, either very theoretical or very, uh, I would say, um, uh, isolated, not necessarily parts of the mainstream. I'm referring, of course, uh, um, here to the, to the uh, use of technology in learning, which is uh, not necessarily mainstream yet. And I will say something about that. But I think that the, um, um, sh let's say this, this COVID-19 um, experience um, has shown to the world at large what it actually means uh, to um, try to use technology in learning. It has shown um, how difficult and how um, nuanced this needs to be. Um, I mean, it is not like uh, um, all of us who drive cars who have got behind a wheel, we knew immediately how to drive a car. Uh, I mean, it is complicated. It is not easy, but at some point you, you, can, you can do it. And this is why I think that also your work is actually very, very relevant in this context. And I'll come back to, to, to this as well. But um, in any case, we saw what is, I believe, rightfully called uh, the remote emergency teaching and learning. So nothing which is really uh, comparable to, a, a, let's say, a proper, um, well-developed um, um, technology enhanced learning or, or, let's say, digital education. Um, we saw a lot of people who were um, cut out and um, this speaks a lot also to the politicians because um, this is where also the necessary awareness is uh, created on how important some fundamental factors such as access and uh, connectivity and infrastructure are. We have observed this around the world. We have observed this also in Europe. I would even say that uh, in Europe, um, we have seen that uh, perhaps we have had a somewhat more optimistic view of ourselves in terms of how well we do and primarily uh, here primary and secondary education systems um, but uh, what was also very very good to see is that um, from this group of early adopters who have started you know decades ago to develop technology enhanced learning and uh, uh, digital education we have seen some really coming into the mainstream. And this is a very important point when we uh, look at long-term developments in society and long-term changes in education and training systems. Um, since uh, the latter are, as we know, um, rather slow to adopt new methods and new ways of teaching and learning. So um, obviously we uh, saw a lot of significant challenges here. And I would also mention a couple of those, but. Um, very concretely, when we in the, in the European Commission were um, uh, starting to work on the Digital Education Action Plan, this was just before COVID came. And uh, in fact, I um, remember very vividly that we started in January uh, last year. Um, we already had our plans and roadmaps and so on and so forth, what you normally have when you start the process. And then, of course, uh, March uh, 13th was for us the day when we had to shut down. And uh, basically everything was uh, um, uh, turned upside down. Um, the, the first reaction that I had was, um, can we actually find now very good um, guidance uh, for uh, the education and training systems just to you know, to know what to do in this kind of emergency? And uh, we soon realized that uh, such a thing does not really exist. It's not well developed. Uh, it is not at least um, uh, known to those who are in charge. So um, we had uh, to, uh, in a way, uh, start uh, a bit more um, again from scratch, also to, um, to talk about how society has experienced this, because the European Commission, of course, um, is uh, having this more higher level, if you like, uh, view, and is, we are not, we are not um, as uh, deeply involved, um, in particular, when it comes to education. I just want to perhaps uh, recall that um, in education and training, the Commission has very limited competences, since many member states are uh, even federal, uh, they have even one layer down of competences, so it's kind of complicated. Still, we have a role there, and I would, I would say something about it, but um, so 
what we do when we launch uh, major initiatives in, in policy in the Commission is um, to um, organize a stakeholder consultation. And um, we have organized a stakeholder consultation um, which um, ran between June last year and um, September. And we have been really impressed um, not only by the pure, if you like, number of uh, contributions we have received, which uh, for our standards, um, the numbers that you see here are very, very high when it comes to education and training initiatives. But what was very, very interesting is that we have also seen a lot of uh, position papers from many different organizations uh, of different nature. And I want to stress that point here um, because um, let's say technology enhanced learning or the adoption of digital education more generally um, is not really something that can be done only by the education and training sector on its own. It does require a number of other actors and uh, you can actually see a little bit the breakdown here. Uh, the private sector was very, very active. Um, the um, NGOs and civil society, but also research organizations were, were quite active. So this was a signal for us that what we are dealing here with is actually a very um, um, huge development uh, of societal importance. And this is why uh, we also um, took uh, a bit um, the opportunity, if you like, of the crisis to talk not only about and to address in the action plan, not only what was the short term um, really uh, deficits, but also to look a little bit at the bigger picture and at the long-term transition of, of education and training. And we found uh, some um, insights or we had some insights from this open public consultation, which will not surprise um, you since you are very deep in all of this, but um, I would nevertheless like to just point them, point out to them. Um, well, I mean, for 60% of those who self-qualified as teachers in our, our open public consultation, this was the very first experience in anything which is related to a distance online learning. And I would argue that this is often also, you know, anything which is uh, involving a lot of technology. 60%. Um, so um, it's quite a big number. And um, many, uh, actually, I would say by far the huge majority experienced this as a uh, sort of a turning point to use technology in education. Um, in addition, we have seen that um, there are many challenges that prevent this from happening in an effective and inclusive way. And the top ones were related, of course, to the um, existing inequalities, um, to the fact that there is not sufficient access, connectivity, um, but also equipment in certain places. Um, we saw uh, that the um, teacher training, as well as the guidance that has been produced by um, the teacher and educator community in particular in the first wave was, uh, was um, I mean, not always uh, what, uh, what was needed. And what is very important for us is uh, that um, underpinning all of this is a certain lack of a more coherent vision towards how to integrate technology in education in, the, in a sustainable way. And uh, I will come back to some of the keywords that you have uh, chosen for your uh, conference here, uh, sustainability of which is one. Um, but um, this is something which is important because um, um, we need to see this longer term transition um, since we're talking about digital transformation and it's not a short term fix as we, as we know, um, uh, but something rather, rather long term. And um, this aspect of the teachers um, has informed quite some thinking and some of the actions that we have proposed. But um, I also want to mention something which the commission particularly pays a lot of attention to. And this is um, um, in the role of the commission as a, um, uh, let's say executive part of the European Union. We are um, also looking at specific targets and uh, uh, among those that the member states have agreed to are targets on digital skills and competences. Now, we have obviously seen how critical they are. 
to continue um, learning, uh, teaching, and generally speaking, functioning. And um, we saw that um, this is another um, aspect where perhaps our um, vision for the long term is not necessarily backed up by everything that we do so far. Um, if I just really use some of the specific numbers here so that I can make that specific point on the skills, I could have taken here also the infrastructure um, or the connectivity gaps within the member states, but I chose to take the skills. Um, we have two big uh, targets when it comes to digital skills attainment at the EU level, and this is something which, what, which the member states are also subscribing to. So they have agreed to this vision and they are also um, uh, aiming to achieve those targets. On the one side, the 80% of what we call basic digital skills, and this applies to the entire population. As you can see here, there is just one country that has uh, achieved this target for uh, 20, I, I should uh, specify that those targets are for 2030. So there is just one. And um, uh, another target, which is very important for us, is the, the, the one on ICT specialists, um, where we want to have uh, 20 million uh, of those. And um, we are also very, very um, far away from uh, achieving this. Um, this picture does not tell you that much because you cannot really see what is the growth rate which is underpinning this. I mean, it could be that this doubles next year. Unfortunately, that's not the case because the growth rate uh, from 2015 until 2019, and I have done this calculation myself, is around, um, so for four years, uh, for the basic digital skills is around uh, two, three percent. Um, I mean, we can be very optimistic that uh, COVID will maybe drive digital skills development uh, further just by necessity. And yet, if you look at here, uh, if you look at some of those numbers uh, for many, many countries, and you just put another 10% on top. I mean, basically what this says is that um, while we have set ourselves very ambitious targets, what we are doing to achieve them in the growth rate that we have seen in the last uh, five, six years um, is just not sufficient. So it's not going to work. And um, I, would, uh, I would even say that um, the kind of the digital um, transformation that I've experienced in the last two years maybe makes um, these targets, I mean, maybe they are not even as ambitious as they might need to be, but that's a different aspect. So I won't question now our own uh, targets here, but just to put this in perspective. So um, I think that um, this shock, the short-term shock, the long-term, um, let's say, target setting um, and the relevant developments in the member states, which suggest that um, business as usual is kind of not sufficient. Um, the lessons that we have experienced from the COVID uh, crisis and the very high policy relevance, and um, I stress this because I, I want to just um, also be humble enough here to, to not, uh, to, to not uh, go into an expert kind of uh, view, but to speak really from the policy perspective, suggests that we will need to address the overall question of how we can have education and training which are fit for the digital age in a maybe slightly different manner. And this is where uh, I think um, the work that we are doing right now, um, as we have started in, in uh, this year, comes, comes into play. And um, it is actually uh, the first, um, if you like, um, a response that the Commission has put out um, following this, uh, this very, very intensive period. It's the Digital Education Action Plan. And um, I uh, would like to um, just put this in a bigger context because um, I mentioned that um, the, the problems that we are observing and, and in education and training cannot be solved only by education and training, but they do require uh, other actors to get involved. And this is why um, I would like to just mention that what we are um, setting out now to do with this uh, multi-annual action plan, which has uh, seven years of uh, duration. However, there will be a midterm also 
evaluation there. So it's not like we're going to be doing for seven years, uh, uh, let's say what we planned, the life will certainly change. Um, this is embedded in really the top uh, level priorities of the European Commission. First, some of you may know that we have now an executive vice president who is responsible for um, what we call a Europe which is fit for the digital age. This is uh, the um, um, executive vice president Margarete Vestager. She is known for other policy aspects, but she is responsible all for digital transformation generally. And um, it is important to understand that um, the question of going digital in education and training is something that becomes also relevant for the big picture, which is normally uh, focused on maybe you know the business sector or maybe on, on, on uh, regulation of platforms and things like this, which tend to get the headlines. Um, it's not always been the case. I'm mentioning because this is novel. The second aspect is that um, the long-term um, vision uh, of Europe um, is, of course, one of uh, evolving uh, integration. And we have the European education area with the Erasmus program, which supports this for many, many years. So this is um, our uh, kind of uh, leitmotif. We want to have a deeper European ed education area with uh, seamless mobility. And you know um, some of these parts. Um, and this action plan is a very important part of enabling this. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. There is a dog here next to me. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply sorry. I'm very sorry. Um, I, ho I was hoping this is not going to happen. Uh, unfortunately, it happened. Um, apologies. You see that it's life, you know. Uh, so <clears throat> um, I hope. <clears throat> so the third aspect, uh, which I mentioned, is the set of targets that we have at the EU level uh, that we um, I just described some of them. So there are some others related also to infrastructure and uh, universal access and so on and so forth. But just you know, tell you that uh, those uh, targets which relate to what we are doing more on the education and, and skills uh, part, they are in there. And of course, the elephant in the room uh, for policy makers in particular, so for Wongs and so on, is the resilience and recovery facility, which is this unprecedented uh, um, let's say one time um, a funding instrument which came out from the from the crisis where we see really um, around 670 billion euros uh, going into um, the um, recovery of the member states and here what is relevant for us is that there are 20 percent which are um, earmarked for digital so 20 percent out of 680 I mean you can do the math it's 130 if you if you look at those 130 it's currently as we of the, the different um, kind of breakdowns of the member states, how they want to invest this money, we see that out of this huge, huge, huge pot, around 20% go in digital education. I mean, I know this is lots of numbers and uh, so on, but just to, to, to orient you, those 20% which come kind of from the uh, next generation, from the resilience facility, they are more or less, a little bit less actually, than the entire Erasmus program for the next seven years. And the entire Erasmus program um, is around 28 billion. So we're talking here about something which is uh, happening and it is very important to inform this with uh, really evidence, with research and with uh, insights which are based on real science and uh, not on just, uh, let's say, uh, throwing money at, at some problems and, and so on and uh, maybe putting additional computers somewhere. So um, it is integrated in, uh, in this bigger vision of the EU. And um, uh, it is also something that uh, informed pretty much our design the action plan. So just to, to give a, a bit of uh, some highlights, um, we are taking an integrated view of developing, um, sorry, uh, applying or using technology learning and the question of um, improving digital skills. For us, these are essentially two parts of the same coin. It's not the same, obviously, but these are our two main priorities. Um, we are also now proposing to go beyond uh, formal education and to include also lifelong learning because we have a huge part of the population. Um, actually, it's the largest part of the population which has um, 
challenges uh, with the um, with the digital skills so it's more the adults rather than those which are in formal education um, we have proposed a longer time period so seven years to be aligned with the programming cycle of the eu because we have different programs that fund activities and we want them to kind of align and obviously uh, coming from from covid um, uh, was that we need to look very carefully at the question of um, uh, quality and inclusion because not everyone is um, uh, let's say inspired by the distance learning experience they had and i think rightly so because in many cases it was very uh, very um, limited so for us what is very important is to really explain that um, this experience of um, uh, remote emergency learning is not equal to a well-designed uh, learning which is enhanced by technology and informed by pedagogical um, let's say understanding um, yes and uh, this transformation as i said it's really a task for many uh, and not just for those who are uh, responsible for education and training and this is this is very important for us and this is why we are working with a number of departments in the european commission who are responsible for really the connectivity part um, or more for the um, let's say with the lifelong learning um, and we are uh, coordinating uh, more and more this type of um, digital education policy so that's one of the tasks that i uh, that i have so uh, i mentioned the resilience and recovery facility and i just wanted to give you a snapshot of what uh, we observe for the time being uh, are maybe the top investment uh, um, fields that the member states have chosen to put their their um, funds when it comes to, to digital education. Um, this is not uh, final because only around 20 member states have already final uh, resilience and recovery plans. So around uh, seven are still outstanding, but you can see here that it's a lot about the infrastructure and equipment, but it is also a lot about um, the uh, training of teachers, um, which I think is a very important area where, um, as I said, evidence and sound research is important uh, since we are going to see many policy uh, measures in the member states who will tackle continuous professional development for teachers and they will have to be well designed um, so this is very very important uh, to to a company for for us um, the two uh, strategic or let's say two um, main priorities that we have um, are uh, as I mentioned it, to develop a uh, what we call a high performing digital education ecosystem. So the whole enablers that need to be in place before we can, um, uh, let's say, uh, look into effective provision of, of um, a technology enhanced learning. So we have to have all these other bits and pieces working well in sync. And uh, on the other side, I mentioned it already, the, the skills and competences aspect for us, it is a critical, um, critical target uh, also for the longer term competitiveness uh, in the EU, but of course also for inclusion and uh, so on. Now, um, I want to um, skip actually this slide because uh, I will then share with you the slides, but this is only the overview of the actions which are in the action plan. Suffice to say that we have um, 14 of those and uh, we are responsible for their implementation beyond the coordination with the member states. Um, I want to spend just a few minutes on uh, reflecting uh, on, on the title of your conference, uh, which is about um, um, things which are very important for us, uh, safe, uh, free and uh, sustainable. Um, and um, I have tried to look a little bit at uh, how we are actually relating to what you have identified I believe um, rightly as, as, as really key, um, key aspects of, of how technology should enhance, lear uh, should enhance learning um, also in future. And I believe that we are very, very aligned. Uh, so what you see here in those bullet points, uh, in those which are bolded primarily are essentially um, actions within the action plan. So when it comes, for example, to the question of safety, um, or for the question uh, to the question of uh, free choice, um, we uh, have um, launched two specific um, actions which are aimed to help educators and teachers um, with uh, phenomena which we believe are not uh, well um, currently integrated in the 
let's say, in the education and training systems. On the one side, this is about how to tackle disinformation. Um, and on the other hand, how to deal with um, AI and data in education and training, since we are seeing a lot of ed tech uh, coming into the systems, but uh, no one really knows the, the kind of the parameters of it. So we have launched um, these two actions just a month uh, ago or two. And we have aligned, a, um, we have um, uh, a group of um, uh, experts, which are around 2025, 20, also including international organizations such as UNESCO, OECD, Council of Europe, etc. And we will be, um, with their help, um, working towards development of such um, guidelines for teachers and educators. Um, and those guidelines should be practical. They would be voluntary, of course, because the Commission cannot impose anything, but they would target really these two fields, which we believe uh, teachers um, need more and more uh, practical, practical help or practical guidance. Uh, we expect this to be um, presented or to be uh, at least uh, finalized um, in autumn next year. And um, another aspect which I believe is very, very important when we speak about um, maybe um, sustainability is um, to support on an ongoing basis um, our teachers and our educators. So we have um, some um, more, let's say, novel activities like the, Euro, uh, uh, the European Erasmus Teacher Academies that we have, uh, that we have launched with the new Erasmus program uh, this year. Uh, but we have also something which has been uh, tried and tested now for two or three years, which is a um, nice and handy and uh, practical self-assessment tool for teachers, which is called Selfie, and which helps um, um, actually um, uh, schools to develop a bit of a picture of um, how they uh, stand, uh, including also some questions related to the, to the competences of their, of their teachers. And um, another aspect which I want to, to highlight here when it comes to the um, um, uh, safe or free or, or sustainable is um, the need to work um, really hand in hand with the member states. And I cannot stress this enough because um, the commission's contribution uh, in whatever terms, you know, financial terms or policy terms is really very, very small compared to what the member states are doing. And this is the real opportunity right now because it has never been the case, at least since I work in the commission and it's now for, for around 13 years and I have observed this field for some time now, it has never been the case that policymakers would be so open to discuss technology and education in one discussion. And it's not, it's not self-explanatory for, many of you, maybe for most of you, and I would put myself there in as well, it's, it's really a no-brainer. But um, for um, people who have traditionally looked at technology and education as really two different kind of worlds, and this is reflected in a lot of ministries in the whole institutional setting of, of big organizations and bureaucracies, this is not at all self-explanatory. And once you put uh, an educator and a technologist in one room, you immediately see why. Um, but imagine to have a politician who needs to listen to those two. So it's not easy. Why I'm saying it? Because uh, we are having three, and I admit these are perhaps a little bit more uh, so kind of bureauc bureaucratic sounding um, actions. Nevertheless, for us, uh, the council recommendations here on blended learning that we just adopted um, uh, one month ago, um, for primary and secondary, um, or the council recommendation on how to improve the provision of digital skills um, in education and training, where we want to put a lot of focus on foundational knowledge, such as computer science, computational thinking, and so on. These are really important because um, the member states will uh, take this more and more. Of course, those that need it, there are some that don't need it, but many do need it. And um, they will um at least share best practice at the european level um learn from those uh, that uh, seem to be uh, more advanced and this is something which is very very important for european cooperation in the field of education and training which is soft it's not regulatory it's not legislative it's more based on two things uh goodwill to cooperate and learn from each other and the second is incentives of course uh, related to the funding from erasmus 
but uh, as I said, in the big picture, this is just uh, really not a big, big, uh, uh, let's say it's a drop on, on something which is much uh, bigger. And um, what I wanted also to perhaps um, mention here is that just one week ago, uh, the Commission President von der Leyen um, delivered a State of the Union address where she uh, speaks uh, every year, mid-September, around the priorities for the next year. And the Commission President um, stressed that the question um, on, of, of digital education and skills which is seen now more and more as something which is, is really related to each other, not just labor market and then education, but something which is linked, that this question um, requires really a top um, level attention, meaning the, really the top government attention and a structured dialogue. Uh, this is important because um, we want, as part of the Digital Education Action Plan, to launch a, such a structured dialogue with the member states and to go in a much more systematic fashion towards um, what makes uh, more inclusive and more effective digital education. So we want to do it not on a, uh, let's say, on what is burning right now, but more on a, on a basis of um, uh, a number of key enabling factors which need to be there. And obviously, we are counting there also on the support of the uh, science and research community and those who develop the evidence. Uh, because we need to inform this discussion, which, as I said, is not, uh, is not uh, an easy one, because not many people outside of this, um, this uh, let's say, place or this, this community, which is, which is, of course, growing, do understand that. So it is very important also to drive this on the policy side. And um, I would like to finish um, with something which I'm, I'm really um, um, very excited about. It is one of the actions of the European uh, of the Digital Education Action Plan, and we call it uh, the Digital Education Hub. And the Digital Education Hub will effectively um, be an interface for um, a more um, effective cooperation for on on digital education at the EU level. It does not exist today. So there is not such a place at EU level. So there is different working groups on, on different uh, parts, but when it comes to, to digital education, um, such a, um, let's say such an interface uh, does not exist at the EU level. We want um, it to also involve the different communities uh, which are active in this field, such as the association that you represent, um, we want this community to share much more actively and in a decentralized way, knowledge and best practice. And uh, we um, hope that this will help to accelerate the adoption of good practice and innovation in digital education. It's a long-term process, but it needs to, let's say, be launched at the European level. And uh, this is why um, we are looking at um, the um, operational launch of this, um, of this um, hub, um, most likely in December, or maybe in, in January next year. This is going to be a long term, um, let's say, uh, initiative that will grow over time. And um, we hope to be able to connect those that work at the cutting edge um, of, of um, uh, technology and education uh, to help others to be inspired and to share practice and really also to create a little bit of a more effective feedback loop between the practice and the policy. That's why also we as a commission are launching it because we, we feel that we need this type of um, insight and help. We, we definitely do not have the entire knowledge in this, in this domain. And we very much believe in the, um, in the community um, that can, um, in, a, in a very, I would say, decentralized fashion, um, without um, a sort of uh, long-term uh, plans uh, and uh, topics, but something which is a bit more agile as well, um, that this community uh, can work more and more um, together uh, from the different parts that it represents. Um, we want to have the member states as part of this. This is why we talk about um, national advisory services. Uh, so we want to have also a link to the, to the member states who uh, can maybe send some practitioners who are involved in this and can learn from this experience. 
And uh, we really are, as I said, quite excited about that one because um, rather than being a project that will end maybe next year or in a, in a two years frame, frame, we believe that this could be a start of a more sustainable um, cooperation on digital education, one which is more focused at EU level. And obviously that would serve um, the, the objectives um, that you have also mentioned in your, in your uh, title, uh, those related to free choice. I mean, we don't want to be uh, completely dependent, technologically speaking, on um, others. Um, uh, and um, we also, of course, want to have a certain sovereignty when it comes to developing our future education and training systems. So um, in that sense, um, I think that we are on to something which is going to be developing over time. And I think that, um, I think that uh, th this discussion today, which for me is, is a first, um, is actually a, a probably, hopefully, a start for, for, a, for a, an exchange. And I, I would really invite you to um, have a look at this. As I mentioned, we're just starting with this unit was created only this year. So you can imagine what, what happens <laughs> when you start something. Uh, so there is lots of things to do, but there are important things to do. And one of them is to talk to the stakeholders who actually know what, what, what this is really about. And so I would finish by uh, really thanking you. I really am so sorry that I cannot come to the city of Bolzano um, because I, I like it very much. And uh, thank you to the university for, for hosting this, even in that way. Um, maybe next time around, and I uh, now would just stop here and to give you the floor, uh, Tine. Thank you for the attention. Uh, any questions or comments, uh, whatever you wish to or uh, get rid of, I'm here now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's uh, give Georgi a round of virtual applause. In case you have questions, you can just raise your hand and I will give you the floor. Or you can also, of course, use the chat window. Roland, you're the first one. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Georgi, for this uh, inspiring keynote. Um, I, I was also very pleased to hear that you think the general line of this conference and this research community is quite in line with also what the European Commission uh, is looking forward to. I was then wondering, is there anything where, where, where you could say, do you have a specific expectation towards the research community in the technology enhanced learning field, how we could even better align with the European Commission and your goals or with topics of uh, societal and maybe even global relevance? Is there anything that, that you can uh, give us on the way? Should I, should I reply, Tina? Or, yeah, great. Thank you very much, uh, Roland. So, I mean, this is a question um, which is uh, absolutely central for me. Um, this is why also I uh, actually went a little bit through um, some of the proceedings of the conference because I, I wanted to see also which kind of topics you are covering. I'm not a researcher myself, but I've been working a bit in, in IT and technology in the past. So I, I think I understand a little bit the basics. So I saw, for example, the. Um, uh, the papers that you have developed um, uh, as, uh, well, not the, the developer, but those that are finalists. Uh, I, uh, I saw the, the, the topics. I was just interested what the community that you represent consider really to be the best. So I saw the, you know, the questions around the formative assessment, the, the um, uh, self-evaluation um, that the other paper presented or the learning goals. Now, my, my very strong view on this, and I may be biased just because I'm a little bit... Um, uh, I mean, I am biased. I do believe in this. Uh, I am, I am uh, someone who supports this since uh, I can remember. I believe that um, what we now need to do is to um, make your voice um, a bit uh, better heard um, in the communities which probably are not listening to you so often. And um, what I'm meaning by this is primarily um, the, um, let's say, what I can do on my end is, of course, to, to connect to policymakers who are not necessarily understanding what technology enhanced learning is and how, uh, let's say, much this is rooted in, in you know, in scientific evidence in, in uh, I mean, um, uh, it is unfortunately still in my discussions with, uh, with uh, different people quite obvious that we need to, go to, to do a lot of groundwork in order to 
convince uh, decision makers that um, what we are talking here about, um, of course, there are different views in the end of the day. So it's not a community with one voice. There are different points of views, but this is a um, field which is um, as relevant for the future of um, education as you know um, deciding on certain standards when it comes to let's say uh, i don't know i mean future communication networks um, i mean we're spending a lot of uh, time and efforts and uh, money to decide on um, you know um, what is going to be 5g or 6g or whatever but if you think about some fundamental things like how we are going to be providing or how we are going to be teaching and learning in this um, in this um, ongoing environment, I think that it is at least as important, but by far not as you know as 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 perceived as. So I think that when it comes to the community, um, it would be very important for um, the community to um, be um, as perhaps uh, you know vocal as possible vis-a-vis uh, -vis the policymakers because in the hands of policymakers over the next few years will be a lot of, let's say, um, possibility and for good or bad. I mean, we can, we can discuss, <laughs> uh, but uh, it is important that these policymakers are as well informed as possible. And it is here where I see the role of your community to um, try whenever possible to translate it in also um, policy implications, policy recommendations. The time to do this, uh, I mean, um, is, I mean, has never been better because they are actually trying to listen to what seems to be working because many are completely lost what, does, what this transition means. Um, and um, the evidence, you know, the scientific um, approach and the long-term um, a research that many of you, I mean, you, you're doing research since decades here. Um, and this needs to become a little bit more kind of um, just um, part of the parlance, part of the narrative when we uh, speak about the digitalization of education and training and how to teach and learn and use uh, technology. So in other words, I think that actually you are absolutely necessary to be part of this um, discussion because people like uh, ourselves who are more promoting these policies. We are not the experts. We need to be convincing and um, we need you also to be part of the kind of enhanced discussion. That's why perhaps, you know, in the future through the digital education hub, we could think of possibilities to exchange this in a structured manner. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think uh, there's, there's a lot of food for thought for the community to take along, um, especially on how to be more visible and more communicative towards policymakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roland, for the question and Georgi for the answer. Uh, the next question will come from Sergei. Uh, thank you. Well, it's great to hear that the Commission shares uh, the same views that this com community shares at the importance of digital education. Took only one pandemic uh, to get there. Um, so one question that I have is, so this is a, so you're talking about this seven year plan uh, and uh, it seems that the motivation really comes you know, from realization uh, of this change that pandemic has brought to educational system. Uh, at the same time, in some countries, you know, the life kind of goes back to normal. So for example, in my university, uh, now all the classes are uh, face to face uh, and uh, in many schools it is the same. So I, I wonder what is the uh, overall motivation uh, for this transformation? Is it still to combat the effect of the uh, pandemic, which is ongoing? Uh, is it to prepare for the potential upcoming pandemic? Uh, is it, you know, just, or is it the realization that, you know, digital education uh, actually is now a new normal and we actually uh, can use it to make our overall educational system more effective? Because it's a, it's a seven year plan, right? And uh, the pandemic is, well, the, I think the worst probably is behind us when it comes to COVID-19. And people are happy to come back to schools. People are happy to come back to classes. Uh, and uh, yes, teachers had to learn very fast how to use Teams and Zoom and so forth. But uh, well, maybe in a year they don't need this skill anymore if everything goes back to normal. What are the expectations? 
Thank you, Sergey. This is this is this is an excellent comment plus question. Um, I mentioned the the short term shock that uh, basically put this on the top of the agenda, but um, I did not elaborate uh, on the fact that this is um, coming also from somewhere. So we we did have a uh, a first very first digital education action plan in 2018, which I would really qualify as a kind of a beta product because it was about uh, seeing to what extent such uh, cooperation at the EU level um, is relevant, you know, and is necessary. So we are not really talking only about the COVID, even though COVID is now in everyone's heads, you are absolutely right. And then we're going back now to the, to the normal. Now, what we expect, and I think that this is why I, I stressed um, uh, to some extent this approach that we work with different fields and that we, we, we kind of look at other parts of society to, to, to have a long-term vision for education, and that's why seven years. This is driven by the deep, I would say, conviction that um, there is, I mean, there will be probably back to normal. But if you look at the behavior um, of uh, students, um, if you look at long-term um, behavioral changes in, in how pupils, um, children um, work with technology, um, then, I mean, you can, you can see that there is something deeper going on in terms of the way um, cognitive functions um, develop and uh, the way how people prefer sometimes also to, consume, to, 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 to learn. Um, I think that when it comes to higher education, for example, we are going to see a lot more hybrid models. It's much more efficient to some extent. I mean... I think in a lecture hall of 250, you're really probably not gonna see that many in physical terms. So I think that for us in, I mean, first point is we do see this long-term transition to digital education. What I really am, uh, and I have to say it's not easy, but your, your question is excellent from that point of view. What I believe is a little bit the danger here is that um, people, just equate the distance learning experience with the overall kind of uh, move to a more technology enabled technology enhanced learning and it is here where the research and the the sound evidence will make a difference because otherwise people you're right i mean they are just like you know they follow uh, sometimes habits they go back once the crisis is over so it's habitual it's very normal i think in human nature Perhaps it brings also a lot of uh, security. But if you look at the way students prefer to run, you know, nowadays their, their classes, um, uh, if you see also how, let's say, overall technology develops, I, I saw that you had Engagely as a, as a keynote speaker. I mean, they are doing some amazing things in terms of uh, the, the, the platform. Um, there is a longer term development and we have to inform that development with sound evidence so my expectation is that we do that because otherwise i see this a little bit like you do that we could fall a bit back into what we knew what we know also because for many of us let's face it the distance learning experience was anything but great huh? so a mental problem like mental health became big big issue um but is this the the fault of distance learning only i mean we can discuss that but um um, no, I mean, we definitely see a longer term transition there. And just to be, to be uh, uh, completely here also transparent, it's a seven year uh, kind of initiative, but we are having a midterm uh, kind of uh, evaluation where we are going to draw really lessons from what is working, what is not working. So halfway through in 2024. Thank you. Thank you very much. I took the opportunity to raise my own hand to ask you a question, which was continuing on the discussion we were having and on how to involve researchers also on policy advice and advising the community of teachers, of schools. And I was trying to reflect on, on the position of myself and of my colleagues, and that it's, I don't, didn't find it that easy to participate in um, policy making and providing policy advice. And there, I thought uh, there were quite some opportunities that we have been part, for instance, of Erasmus Plus policy making projects, which I really thought was a great opportunity. 
And then it made me reflect on why do not more of my colleagues or myself do not do more of these projects. And one of the things I found is that there's not a good um, incentive to do so inside university. A lot of researchers are being valued inside university for their research, for their publications. Their impact is being counted on how many citations they get in high impact journals. And of course, this policy advice is not valued in the same manner. Just an example of my university, the projects you get from uh, Erasmus Plus, for instance, they're not counted for the grants you are collecting. They're just like on a big education thing, um, your education value, and there's no money involved, for instance. So there is no a good incentive from our universities to make our verse voices heard at the policy level, nor at the societal level. So do you believe that the EU could help researchers coming, bringing their voices forward in the policy um, uh, advice and in the societal debate more by influencing the universities and maybe the countries? That is a great question. So uh, um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I would be I would be very honest and I would say that uh, probably it's going to be a very difficult task what you just described because it's related to the also institutional uh, incentives set by you know the academic kind of paths and the, the the way specific uh, specific performance is measured. So um, influencing universities, in my experience, um, from from the point of view of, of the EU, is possible through setting specific again incentives. If we were, for example, to do this, um, and we are actually doing it with this new scheme on the European University Alliances, where we are bringing universities much closer together than before. And I would give you that example as one possible way forward. I mean, it's very early days, but uh, just why I think it could be interesting is because we want to see in the European University Alliances a much deeper level of integration. And um, for us, it's a little bit of a, um, of a, I mean, not an experiment, but it's a, it's a very important uh, example of whether we can go deeper in terms of cooperation and uh, for uh, the influencing of the policy here, I think we are uh, going to be obviously listening to the to the universities themselves. So first of all, we are going to want to have firsthand feedback. And I think from that point of view, there could be some uh, influence. Um, on, let's say, more generally changing the structures and so on, I, I, I have to be very honest, and I know it's not a great answer, but I, I don't think uh, we can do that. Um, but I think there is something else which is sort of emerging. Um, and this is the um, really, really the power of the community, if I can just put it like this, um, with more and more decentralization and with more and more um, sort of a community who drive specific agendas. Um, I think that there is some longer term um, uh, change going on because um, let's face it um, I mean the problems of, of the um, let's say of the policy um, they are partly self-inflicted because I mean we listen to whoever we listen okay it's uh, there are we can we can certainly say that there are lots of gaps here but I think that there is a certain realization um, especially in our domain I can talk now about us that we really need to do this together with the community. Um, and I believe that from that point of view, um, the influence of the researchers and those who work on evidence will only increase because we are entering in a, in a relatively immature kind of policy here because, I mean, we are not as advanced and we need to inform this through much more research and evidence so that it kind of works, really. Uh, and we move beyond the experimentation and uh, kind of um, a project based where three years and then game over and then another project somewhere else. And then it turns out it's kind of similar, but no one connected the dots. So I think that empowering this community um, and it's not easy for a bureaucracy to say, oh, I will trust the community. 
it's not easy because bureaucracies tend to think that they know this best. But um, from our point of view, I see no other choice because um, this is such a complex matter that we can uh, work on it effectively only with those who are uh, on the field. And you know, to come back to your question, I think this will help to increase a little bit the, um, if you like, the relative weight of the kind of the, the researchers' advice, the visibility of, of science, um, because we are in a in a domain which really, I mean, is not as um, um, established compared to I don't know maybe some other parts of training, uh, labor market policies, and so on. So it's more of a hope uh, looking forward, but. Uh, Thank you very much for the answer. And I think we should all take the opportunity there to, to fill the gaps that you have uh, highlighted here. I think we about um, time now to thank you again for being here for your great presentation and for sharing so much insights and especially also for the call for actions to our community. So thank you very much. Let's give another round of virtual applause. Thank you, thank you as well. I was, I was, uh, uh, it was really great to be here with you. I hope it was useful for you. Uh, I realize that sometimes policy language can be very, very far from from some of the daily experiences we have. But um, we are really, I mean, very excited about what happens. And I'm sorry for the dog, but uh, it just happened. So uh, uh, you cannot engineer that. So it's a, it's a computer science problem. It's not an engineering one. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we all know the challenge of, of working at home. So uh, we, we feel even more connected to you right now. So thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Georgi. And uh, um, I will send you thank you email afterwards with also the link to the recording. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, have a good uh, finish of your conference. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.